day, everyone, and thanks a lot for joining us for this edition of Newsmakers. I'm Carolyn Murray. When the Motley Rice Law Firm won that large class action lawsuit against the cigarette makers for $300 billion, well, this country took notice. They wondered how this guy from small town South Carolina could handle such big cases. He's in our studio today. We are speaking with Joe Rice about his love of the law. Stay with us. We are all local all the time. Named one of the nation's best in many areas, we are very happy to have as our newsmaker today, Mr. Joe Rice of Motley Rice Law Firm here in Charleston, as well as in many other cities across the country. Joe, it's great to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here today. A lot of people think of you simply as, not simply, but very much as a litigator, a very powerful litigator in this country. We know that your name is associated with some of the biggest class action lawsuits that this country knows, but I thought we'd take this opportunity to find out a a little bit more about your appreciation and, and if you will love of the law and how you became such an effective attorney w do you have attorneys in your family is that what influenced I, no you? I, there was no attorneys in my family um, I'm the first attorney that well, I say that my daughter's an attorney now uh -huh. but I was the first my grandfather um, was a paymaster at a um, mill up in Anderson South Carolina and he used to go buy law books and read them um, and I just learned to enjoy the law and love the law growing up and watching Perry Mason and, and other TV shows and, and how it worked and the process and the respect people had for the law. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided to try to become a lawyer. Yeah, and you are South Carolina born. You told me you were born, actually grew up in Winsboro, South Carolina? Uh, I was born in Columbia, lived in Winsboro. It was uh -huh. so small at the time, it didn't have a hospital. <laughs> but um, my dad was in the textile mill industry, and at that time, textiles was prominent in our state, um, but we moved around a lot. So I lived in Winsboro, South Carolina, Fieldale, Virginia, Lexington, North Carolina, Clinton, South Carolina. Oh, my gosh. Um, then Gastonia, North, North Carolina, Carolina. And then I went to South Carolina to school. Wow. And I've been in South Carolina ever since. Uh -huh. What were your ideas about the kind of attorney you would become? Did you have those ideas very early on? You just knew you wanted to practice law. You knew you wanted to be in front of a jury I, arguing a case. It's, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, when I got out of law school, I had no idea when I went to law school what I wanted to do other than be a lawyer. Um, when I was in law school, I worked at North Myrtle Beach every summer and every spring break and all to earn money. And my, my mom and dad lived in Whiteville, North Carolina at the time. So that's where I... Uh, was working and my intent was to go back to North Myrtle Beach and um, work just whatever came in the door. Uh -huh. You know, property transactions, DUIs, things I had watched and, and learned while working there. Uh -huh. And it was by happenstance that uh, Ron Motley called me during the summer re law review process and uh -huh. asked me if I would have lunch with him. And um, so I did. And he was looking to hire a young lawyer to move to Barnwell, South Carolina. At the time, I didn't know where Barnwell was. <laughs> um, and you thought, what wrong have I done you yeah. that you want to send me to Barnwell? Well, I, um, I talked to my mom and dad, and some other things were happening at the beach. So um, I was scheduled to get married in August of 79, and this was July. And I was thinking, you know, am I going to make all these changes? Right. But uh, Some of the biggest decisions of your life happening at one time. Um, so um, I took the job. Uh -huh. I went down to Barnwell and interviewed with uh, Mr. Blott um, and Ron and Miles Lodeholt, Terry Richardson, and others at the firm at the time. And, you know, small towns were part of my background. Uh -huh. So that didn't bother me at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agreed to go down and told him I'd be there for two years. And that was in 1979. So I've been with Ron ever since. Wow, 1979. Now, of course, we th when we think of you, we think of a lot of things, certainly success, the obvious signs of success. I mean, you're, the Motley Rice firm name is associated with doing things well and doing things in a big way. How did it grow to become such a powerful force, do you think? Was it a collective vision or was it the result of what was happening in this country and in the world? Well, I think that um, 
Ron Motley's vision for the law and what the law could do and how the law could be used to change things uh, was unique at the time mm -hmm. and probably is still unique today. And by far, Ron is the, the, the smartest attorney I've ever met. And so his vision and, and what I learned from him in the you know, first couple of years um, made it evident that he was going to do things different. He was going to make things happen. So I guess I just decided to hook up with Ron and see what would happen. And he's given me a lot of opportunities. Um, a lot of people talk to us, talk about us being inside, outside. He's in the courtroom. I'm outside the courtroom trying to work resolutions out. And we, you know, just started doing um, cases together. And they kept getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there was a particular side when you talk about inside, outside, that was more difficult? Obviously, you were both able to handle your task very well. But being outside the courtroom, this is in terms of, of acting as a mediator, I would imagine, a lot of times. Well, and the person negotiator who has to, more the than The negotiator right. and, and compromising, those kinds of things. It, it, you know, that sort of developed years later. But Ron and I tried um, a lot of lawsuits together. We tried um, in we were in Beaumont, Texas for almost a year trying um, asbestos cases together. We were in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we had a consolidation of, you know, 8,000 cases um, in Baltimore that we were trying. And it was during the, the courts, um, a period of time where our courts were a little more progressive in trying to um, give people a chance to move their case through the courthouse and not move it slow. Mm -hmm. um, that we started developing unique techniques to try cases and uh, got more aggressive. And Joe, do you believe that this was a time when there was much more um, or many more options perhaps or a certain sensitivity to the victims and the people who were looking for relief from these large lawsuits that they may have been a part of? I think that that's part of it, Carolyn, but I think that also, the courts were frustrated with their own ability to move cases. Mm -hmm. um, and even today, if you, you listen to um, Justice Toll, I mean, one of the problems that all the systems have, not just South Carolina, mm -hmm. is not enough judges, not enough courthouses to move cases in a timely fashion. And this is one a perfect example of this is the, the um, Gulf oil spill today. You know, the Alaska. Um, Exxon Valdez case took almost 15 years to get through court. Those people can't afford to wait to get relief. And the people in the Gulf Coast need to have something done now. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the frustrations that all courts have. And it's not cr being critical of the court or being critical of the legislature. They have to, you know, use the budget and, and process what they can with the, the budget they have. But it does require courts to be um, more creative, um, more aggressive, um, and more progressive. And, and how does that relate, do you believe, Joe, to tort reform? A lot of people have been critical of tort reform and they believe that it is not beneficial to the victims and that it is beneficial to attorneys. How do you respond to that? Well, tort reform is, uh, it, it, that label is used for a lot of different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, when you're limiting people's rights to access to the court, that's not tort reform. That's sure. trying to rewrite our Constitution. Um, yes, there are frivolous lawsuits filed, but you know, those lawsuits don't usually get very far. The system cleans them out pretty quick, and, and they don't, um, that's not what's clogging the system, so to speak. And I've always heard people, they talk about the McDonald's case and how that was a frivolous suit. Well. I can see this and is tell a woman you, who spilled the woman that was got hot coffee and spilled, spilled it on her lap and burnt. Sure. I have seen the pictures of that woman. I have seen the the records of McDonald's. There's a documentary that's been done. It's called Hot Coffee mm -hmm. that tells the story. There was nothing frivolous about that lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And the damages and the severity of her injuries um, and the knowledge that uh, McDonald's or at least that McDonald's had. Um, so it's not frivolous lawsuits. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's changed and what's big in our um, judicial system and our legal system and even our society today is technology. Um, things happen so quick. Um, you know, something happens this morning in a courtroom in Washington, D.C., 
everybody in the country knows about it in 30 minutes. I mean, you'll get it on your smartphone or on the computer or you'll flash it you know, across the screen and we've got reporters all over the world you know, at any point Cameras in time. Cameras are in the courtroom watching and hearing yes. everything. So technology has just been the biggest change. And, and does that influence what happens in the courtroom, Joe, because there is immediate, con not just immediate, but constant access to this information? Yes. And it influences what happens in the jury room as well, mm -hmm. because you cannot sit down and, on, at TV at night and not see some type of crime show or some type of legal show. And our society is now shaped by, the, by technology, by what they see and what they read and what they hear. And it's just changing the way people think and the way people do things. I mean, I was sitting at a football game the other day and there was a two-year-old sitting there playing with an iPad. Sure. And, and, that's, and they say that's a constant right. toy for them now, and it's a great learning tool. It is. But just think of the changes in technology. Right, yeah. Well, we are going to find out more about the vision of the Motley Rice Law Firm when we come back. We are speaking with Joe Rice. Stay with us. We are all local all the time. Thank you very much for staying with us as we continue our conversation with Joe Rice of Motley Rice Law Firm. Joe, you know, you've, your firm is associated with some of the biggest cases. We think of asbestos, tobacco, um, helping the victims of 9-11. Which one, and, and I know that they all stand out and you probably think of them, but when you think of those cases, which one do you think of most often because of its impact on those families? Well, I think that the tobacco litigation and tobacco case and the settlement of the tobacco probably had the greatest impact on the most people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, we don't have six, seven, eight-year-olds smoking cigarettes like we did 15 or 20 years ago. Um, the education and the knowledge. Now, people can have a free choice. You can smoke cigarettes, that's fine, and that's your choice, but you now at least you know the truth about what could happen. Mm -hmm. And we don't have um, young people being influenced inappropriately to um, start smoking at a young age. So I think it's, as far as the public health change and the change in our society, that's, a, that's been a big change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's still even, despite the strides that have been made in that effort to educate people about the hazards of smoking and what will happen and seeing those images, there's still somewhat of a fight going on. Oh, sure, and there always will be. I mean, it's a legal product, sure. and, and there's, they are entitled to sell the product as long as it's legal. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always gonna be advertising and marketing, and people are gonna smoke because they want to, and that's okay, that's a free choice. Sure. And I believe in the, in the free choice, but I believe in the free choice with full information. Mm -hmm. Describe that settlement again, Joe. Um, the, the total settlement came up to a little over um, $300 billion um, for all the states, and it's paid out. The baseline is about $8 billion a year divided among all the states, and it increases or decreases depending on the volume of cigarettes sold. And for the good part is the cigarette volume has gone down drastically, so the money has gone down. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's that's an interesting good part. That's a good part. <laughs> and the, the other big change in that settlement was the the disclosure of the, the health consequences and the willingness of the tobacco companies to give up what were constitutionally protected rights of free speech. No longer will they use cartoon characters. You won't have the Marlboro Man. Uh, you won't have the sponsorships for teenage events. Um, you won't have you know free samples walking up and down the beach. I mean, I used to work in North Myrtle Beach and the best looking girls for the summer were hired by the tobacco companies to walk up and down the beach and give out little packs of cigarettes that had three to six cigarettes in them on the theory that if we can get you started, we can keep you. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know that that is the case to pursue? How does your firm know that this is the one that we will go after? Well, we get an opportunity to look at a lot of legal um, cases at Motley Rice. We get calls from all over the, uh, the country from law firms, and we try to look at uh, a factual pattern and say, is this a cause that we want to undertake? And so we like to pride ourselves to say we're more about the cause than the case. Mm -hmm. um, and when we take on something like tobacco or something like the terrorist, um, 
So that's one of the things. Is it something that sh we want to be involved in? Do our lawyers get enthusiastic about saying, this is something that I can do that's going to change the way the country works or the way things work? So you look at it in terms of globally and the greater impact for the greater good of, of all people. I won't know, go so far as globally mm -hmm. because we try to stay in the United States, <laughs> but certainly what we think is going to make the biggest difference to the people of the United States. Mm -hmm. And when after the 9-11 attacks, um, you know, Ron made a decision that we ought to do something um, to try to help change the events that were occurring. And we got into the law books and found that there were laws have been on the books for years and years and years that gave our courts the right to prosecute people that um, furthered um, non-humanitarian um, conduct or conduct against civil rights or, or against, you know, just basic decency. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we brought in the, um, the use of the U.S. courts and we sued the terrorists in the, fun, uh, the countries that were financing the terrorists finance and Al-Qaeda. Now, we've been in litigation now for 10 years up in New York on that case, but recently um, there's been a piece of legislation passed that is going to uh, give those victims um, a greater chance to, um, to receive compensation, not the people that were hurt the day of the 9-11 uh, event, but all the cleanup workers and all those folks and the families. So there's about four or 5,000 folks in that lawsuit. We know that your interest is not always only in those class action lawsuits, but I wanted to bring your attention to a story that certainly has made national news headlines as well as local news headlines talking about the allegations of misconduct, sexual assault against children. Um, Lewis Skip Reveal, his association with the Citadel, always tied, of course, with honor and respect and the best behavior. And we know now that there was a horrible mixing of the two. Um, what is your reaction when we hear about the lack of reporting that happened from those people in positions of authority at the Citadel, though they were made aware of the potential of sexual assault happening on that school campus? It, it's, um, it's surprising. Um, it's shocking. I, mean, I know a lot of Citadel graduates that are just very discouraged about um, what they were taught and what they learned at the Citadel and what happened, in, in fact. Um, the fact that the Citadel had the 160-page report, they, they went to the trouble to conduct an investigation. They spent a lot of time and a lot of money to conduct an investigation, and then they put it in the, in the drawer. Uh, and that's, that conduct cannot be accepted in our society. When we hear about mandatory reporting and what it means that some states require certain people in our state clearly list those people, is there um, or should there be uh, the idea of the spirit of the law and the letter of the law that an adult or any person should feel compelled, you would think, to respond when they hear about something like this? It's, yes, they're, they're, the law is, the law is written and there's codes and there's statutes, but it's basically on the principle that do the right thing. Um, treat people the right way. And how can you not believe the right thing to do in that situation once you had investigated it was not turn over the information you had to the proper authorities, particularly as time goes forward and they knew what Mr. Ravel was doing as a career. They knew that it was putting him in a situation where he would be in contact, contact with young boys. And then they kept it in the drawer. Mm -hmm. And that's just unbelievable and irresponsible. Yeah. All right. Well, we want you to stay with us. We'll continue our discussion. Okay. We want to know what you are doing when you are not practicing <laughs> law, if that is ever the case. All right. We'll talk about that. All right. Stay with us. We are speaking with Joe Rice. We are all local, all the time. You've no doubt heard the name Motley Rice. We have Joe Rice of the Motley Rice Law Firm in our studio. And I was asking, Joe, what do you do when you are not practicing law? And you actually have a pretty full schedule. Oh, I, I enjoy being outside. And I do 
everything I can to spend as much time outside on the weekends and when I'm not working, um, whether it's playing golf, taking the opportunity of low country and just go fishing, uh -huh. find me a creek somewhere, find a pond, or um, I guess one of my you know favorite things is just to get on a horse and ride through the woods. Are you a solitary kind of person when you are not working? Do you enjoy the quiet time? You may go out on the creek by yourself. Yeah, just, yeah. I spend a, you know, I like to play golf with other people. Also, sure. But I do enjoy just relaxing and not having to put up with a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of commotion. So I, um, I spend a lot of time with just one or two people fishing or or riding horses. Any good places that we need to know about where you've... I'm you not going to tell you about of that. Of course you're not, but I thought I might catch you off guard. I should have known you were much too quick for that. Um, I, I do want to find out from you about what you might be doing if you were not a, an accomplished attorney. What would you do otherwise? Um, I don't really know. Um, I enjoyed, I did some work for the Low Country Children's Center and doing some fundraising and I enjoyed that. and. Um, it's a great organization to have in our community now, particularly, as you said, what's happening in our community today. So um, I'd probably do some more charitable work, some more work of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm enjoy. sure they, are, they do a wonderful job, we know, under the direction of uh, Dr. Libby Ralston, who is yes. now stepping down or stepping away. Well, we're going to miss Libby, we but that's okay. We are going to miss her, yeah. She's, she's not going far. She is not. And then um, I've try to do some work with the Hollins Cancer Institute um, mm -hmm. and they've recently received their great honors a National Center and that's great and they worked hard for that and so um, you know I'd probably do more stuff like that mm -hmm. and probably try to improve my golf game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that there's some people watching who will say and he needs to do that he needs yeah, to probably work in do his that. <laughs> I'm sure you handle yourself just fine out there uh, you know when we think of how much you appreciate law and you said that your daughter is also an attorney and, and working in the New York area. Um, are you surprised by the small numbers of people now entering the field of law? And what would be your recommendation? I know that the field is, some would say it's, it's crowded, but you say, you know, do we need more attorneys and more judges? We know that we well, are lacking when it comes yeah. to having enough people sitting on the bench. I don't think I, I um, limit going to law school to being an attorney practicing law. I think the the education of a law the law education the process that you learn is fantastic to have in any business that you're going to go into. Mm -hmm. So as far as going to law school, I would encourage as many people that that feel they want to do that to do that. Mm -hmm. um, now there's a difference between getting a law degree and practicing law, um, and you have to enjoy the law in and of itself and have to want to spend the time. Um, and pay your dues, so to speak, if you're going to practice law. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, people that are looking to practice law that can't find jobs today, just like in other professions. The unemployment um, situation has affected <clears throat> law graduates just as it has every other profession. So there is an economic impact of going for three more years of, of college um, for professional training, and um, you have to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage anyone that wants to go into a business career that has the ability and the time um, and the, the, the desire to get that law degree because it's a great degree to have to just balance out your, your business. Well, you have done so well, and so congratulations to you and to all of the, the fine attorneys that you have at your law firm. We are just about out of time, but any final words from you as we look forward to hearing great things from you and the way that you continue to impact this country as it comes to protecting the rights of people? Well, you know, we... Um, we appreciate the support for the community. We hope we give back to the community. We try to stay as involved as possible in, in the, the Race for the Cure and um, East Cooper, the Mills on Wheels, and, and all the local projects. Um, we are a local firm, and we want to help people locally as well. Mm -hmm. So everybody thinks of us as a national firm, and, yeah, we do get a lot of work nationally, and we travel a lot. But uh, we're here to um, be a member of this community as well. well. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and to help people in low country. It's a great place to live. 
It has been a pleasure speaking with you and a man who seems to struggle with using the word I. It is all <laughs> <laughs> since you walked in here, it has been we, and I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Great to talk to you. Take care. And thank you very much for your time and attention as well. If you have an idea of a newsmaker, we would like to find out more about that person. You can contact us at newsmakers at comcastc2.com. Thank you again for your time and attention, and enjoy your day. Thank you.